Hello. I hope you're having a fine winter. Or I suppose whatever season you're watching this in. At the time of recording, I am in the middle of the holidays in between Christmas and New Year. And I wanted to take a look at a couple of the things that I got for Christmas. I got two books that are both very interesting. This one, Chaos, Making a New Science by James Glick. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that name right. And Incomplete Nature by Terence W. Deacon. How mind emerged from matter. I think these were both on my wish list for quite a while, and now I have them. This one I'm familiar with, or I knew about because of the author. James Glick wrote a book called The Information, and I read that book at a point in my life when I was Sort of, I was in between careers, and I was reconstructing my view of the world at the time. And that book was majorly influential on me. It's about information theory and the history of information theory and the technologies associated with the flow of information and data. It was a very dense but readable book and I completely loved it. Uh, so I put this one on my wish list. Although this is not a topic that I am well versed in, uh, physics primarily is what the book is about. I, I studied physics a little bit in college, but not to any substantial degree. Uh, but despite that, I am, first of all, finding it a quick read. I'm all, I can't believe I'm already this far. And I'm finding it extremely accessible, and some of the ways that the ideas are communicated are um, very compelling. So this is about chaos theory, which is the study of um, dynamical systems, complex systems, deterministic but non-predictable system. And it's been talking about the history of how these theories, how chaos theory came about, as well as the specifics of the ideas that were revolutionary in this space. Um, I'm very much enjoying it. The author is, uh, it's, it's just, it's just, it's a joy to read something challenging by an author that I trust. And so I'm, I'm finding this, uh, delightful. And interesting, I never think about physics, so having this book kind of present in my mind as I look around uh, at my life and the world. It's fun to put it 
a bit of a different perspective on things. Here's my hastily made bookmark. Um, and this author, on the other hand, is not one that I'm familiar with, so I'm a little bit more cautious and wary at this point. And I haven't started this book from the beginning yet. I've just flipped through it. Uh, as far as I can tell, this book is about the both the sciences and the philosophies involved in the exploration of awareness and selfhood. And uh, this is a topic, obviously, that's very intriguing for me, and it's also one that I I don't know, I'm a little bit apprehensive about, but only because I don't know what the author's going to say, so. And, uh, I might start this one soon. I, I normally don't read two books at once, but it might be interesting to read these in parallel, partly because the self and the brain is a very complex system, and it might be interesting to see how parallel the concepts of chaos theory are in relation to this book. But I can also tell that this book is going to take me much longer to read. It's even more dense than this is. And covers a wide breadth of topics. So it's got chemistry and biology, but it also has philosophy and I think just a variety of academic pursuits. seems appropriate since selfhood is one of the most, it's, it's obviously a universal experience for everyone and touches everything that happens to us and is also, as far as I know, almost a complete mystery about how it comes about, consciousness specifically. So. I'd like to do is uh, flip through both of these books without any particular location or topic in mind, just to scan through them and find a couple things to read. This book was initially published in the late 80s, 1987 which uh, I just started reading it without checking the date, and I thought it was modern, um, or contemporary, I guess, and until it was talking about the current, the present day, and it was talking about um, Western scientists and scientists in the Soviet Union. And I was like, Soviet Union? <laughs> So then I checked, and it's just, oh, this is this is an older book. This uh, it's about as old as I am. So that's interesting. I think the '80s was when this topic was really like really really big. 
I guess I don't know that for sure, but I know that when I was growing up, there was a book about chaos theory in, in my house that uh, came out in the 80s, too, I believe. But I was too young to read it at that point. first part is about Lorentz, who studied weather systems, and he published an article in a journal that was about chaos, but it, since it was in a meteorology journal, it didn't get noticed or recognized by physicists or mathematicians uh, for a while. I'm on a chapter now that's about Mandelbrot, who uh, is probably most famous for his work with fractals. Uh, apparently he was quite a polymath, though, and studied lots of different disciplines. There are some color in the center here, the Mandelbrot set. The Coke Curve, Lorentz Attractor, It's fun to learn about some of the stuff that I've seen around, but I didn't know what it meant. The, this uh, diagram here of a Lorentz attractor is a diagram that's depicted in phase space. So, let's see where's a good illustration of phase space. Seen one here. So here's on the top here is a traditional time series, and on the bottom is the same series in phase space. They are two ways of displaying the same data and gaining a picture of a system's long term behavior. The first system converges on a steady state, a point in phase space. The second repeats itself periodically, forming a cyclical orbit. The third repeats itself in a more complex waltz rhythm, a cycle with period three. And the fourth is chaotic. I'm to the level of understanding where I can understand what I'm reading here, but maybe not to the level of understanding that I could effectively explain the same concept to someone else. So as I go through the book, I'm still kind of synthesizing this information. And I don't know if I'll get to that third stage of understanding, but we'll see. This is a diagram called the Cantor Dust. Begin with a line, remove the middle third, then remove the middle third of the remaining segments, and so on. The Cantor set is the dust of points that remain. They are infinitely many, but their total length is zero. I encountered this in my bioinformatics book. The paradoxical qualities of such constructions disturbed 19th century mathematicians, but Mandelbrot saw the Cantor set as a model for the occurrence of errors in an electronic transmission line. Engineers saw periods of error-free transmission mixed with periods when errors would come in bursts. Looked at more closely, 
The bursts, too, contained error-free periods within them, and so on. It was an example of fractal time. At every time scale, from hours to seconds, Mandelbrot discovered that the relationship of errors to clean transmission remained constant. Such dusts, he contended, are indispensable in modeling intermittency. It also just described how he found that same pattern in economic systems, uh, where, like for example, the stock prices, you know, they'll go up or they'll go down, and and the the amount that they go up or down can't be predicted, but the relationship between how the price changes over the course of a day versus how it changes over the course of a month versus how it changes over the course of a year, these relationships between different scales are constant and predictable. I think, again, I sort of struggle to describe exactly what that is, but um, it's a, well, if you've ever seen one of those visualizations, it's like the more you zoom in on a Mandelbrot set, it just, it looks like the exact same set, like all over again, and you can just keep zooming in infinitely. It says, a voyage through finer and finer scales shows the increasing complexity of the set, with its seahorse tails and island molecules resembling the whole set. By the last frame, the level of magnification is about one million in each direction. I find these kinds of visualizations very, um, intimidating, in a way. It's such a raw look at complex mathematics, but it's right there, visualized. You don't have to piece it together in your head. And the, there's, a, there's a segment in here about Jupiter's red spot, which I found very, uh, I, I guess um, it was used as an example of a complex weather system that had chaos within it, but it, it remained stable, which is sort of the Part of the definition of a chaotic system, it's it's got a stability to it, but there are smaller chaotic patterns that never quite repeat themselves and can't be predicted. Universality. The iterating of these lines brings gold. The framing of this circle on the ground brings whirlwinds, tempests, thunder, and lightning. Looks like this is a chapter about another scientist. I think so far each chapter has been about a different scientist. This is Mitchell Feigenbaum. 
Order and chaos, which was science's oldest cliché. The idea of hidden unity and common underlying form in nature had an intrinsic appeal, and it had an unfortunate history of inspiring pseudoscientists and cranks. When Feigenbaum came to Los Alamos National Laboratory in 1974, a year shy of his 30th birthday, he knew that if physicists were to make something of the idea now, they would need a practical framework, a way to turn ideas into calculations. It was far from obvious how to make a first approach to the problem. Feigenbaum brought to Los Alamos a conviction that his science had failed to understand hard problems, non-linear problems. Although he had produced almost nothing as a physicist, he had accumulated an unusual intellectual background. He had a sharp working knowledge of the most challenging mathematician, mathematical analysis, new kinds of computational technique that pushed most scientists to their limits. He had managed not to purge himself of some seemingly unscientific ideas from 18th century romanticism. He wanted to do science that would be new. He began by putting aside any thought of understanding real complexity and instead turned to the simplest nonlinear equations he could find. Uh, nonlinearity um, is the theme so far throughout the entire book. And it's an important one. So a, a linear system or a linear equation is one where well, the simplest example is a is a graph of a line, right? Uh, y equals y equals two x or whatever, and for any x you put in, you can know the value of y because there's like a one-to-one -one relationship between the input and the output, or at least a, a ratio relationship between them. But nonlinear equation, nonlinear systems, okay, here's linear <clears throat> equations are solvable, which makes them suitable for textbooks. Linear systems have an important modular virtue. You can take them apart and put them together again. The pieces add up. Nonlinear systems generally cannot be solved and cannot be added together. In fluid systems and mechanical systems, the nonlinear terms tend to be the features that people want to leave out when they try to get a good, simple understanding. Friction, for example. Without friction, a simple linear equation expresses the amount of energy you need to accelerate a hockey puck. With friction, the relationship gets complicated because the amount of energy changes depending on how fast the puck is already moving. Nonlinearity means that the act of playing the game has a way of changing the rules. You cannot assign a constant importance to friction because its importance depends on speed. Speed, in turn, depends on friction. That twisted changeability makes nonlinearity hard to calculate, but it also creates rich kinds of behavior that never occur in linear systems. The other, so, uh, hockey and friction uh, is one example of a nonlinear system. I also like this one, the Lorentzian water wheel. The first famous chaotic system discovered by Edward Lorentz corresponds exactly to a mechanical device, a water wheel. The simple device proves capable of surprisingly complicated behavior. The rotation of the water wheel shares some of the properties of the rotating cylinders of fluid in the process of convection. The water wheel is like a slice through the cylinder. Both systems are driven steadily by water or by heat, 
and both dissipate energy. The fluid loses heat, the buckets lose water. In both systems, the long-term behavior depends on how hard the driving energy is. Water pours in from the top at a steady rate. If the flow of the water in the water wheel is slow, the top bucket never fills up enough to overcome friction, and the wheel never starts turning. If the flow is faster, the weight of the top bucket sets the wheel in motion. The water wheel can settle into a rotation that continues at a steady rate. But if the flow is faster, the spin can become chaotic because of nonlinear effects built into the system. As buckets pass under the flowing water, how much they fill depends on the speed of spin. If the wheel is spinning rapidly, the buckets have little time to fill up. Also, if the wheel is spinning rapidly, buckets can start up the other side before they have time to empty. As a result, heavy buckets on the other side moving upward can cause the spin to slow down and then reverse. In fact, Lorentz discovered over long periods, the spin can reverse itself many times, never settling down to a steady rate and never repeating itself in any predictable pattern. I, I really like this example. They, um, prior to this example, they talked about it in terms of um, heated fluid uh, and how how fluid rises and falls and, and mixes if it's heated from the bottom. Uh, and that's obviously a good example, but this one, I, just, I also really like it too. And the book has also talked about how nonlinear systems used to be taught to students as exceptions Like they, it was indicated that most systems and most uh, solutions in the world are linear, and then nonlinear is um, are exceptions. But in fact, the reverse is very much true. Where most systems are nonlinear, they have pieces of them, like the overall system depends on a smaller piece, but the smaller piece depends on the overall system and. They have this feedback back and forth. Um, most behavior, I guess, in the world is like that. Okay, let's hop over to this one. This one was written 2012, so quite a bit newer than the Chaos book. Here's the section headings. Absence, holes, homunculi, golems, teleonomy, emergence, constraint, homeodynamics, morphodynamics, teleodynamics, autogenesis, work, information, significance, evolution, self, sentience, consciousness. And then there's an epilogue in which the subheadings are nothing matters, the calculus of intentionality, and value. So this is going to be pretty heavy, I think, to get into. It seems like a very ambitious book. This first section is about zero or absence. 
Consider the following familiar facts. The meaning of a sentence is not the squiggles used to represent letters on a piece of paper or a screen. It is not the sounds these squiggles might prompt you to utter. It is not even the buzz of neuronal events that take place in your brain as you read them. What a sentence means, and what it refers to, lack the properties that something typically needs in order to make a difference in the world. The information conveyed by the sentence has no mass, no momentum, no electric charge, no solidity, and no clear extension in the space within you, around you, or anywhere. More troublesome than this, the sentence you are reading right now could be nonsense, in which case there isn't anything in the world that they could correspond to. But even this property of being a pretender to significance will make a physical difference in the world if it, some, if it somehow influences how you might think or act. Despite this something not present that characterizes the conscience of my thoughts and the meanings of these words, I wrote them because of the meanings that they might convey. And this is presumably why you are focusing your eyes on them and what might prompt you to expend a bit of mental effort to make sense of them. In other words, the content of this, or any sentence, a something that is not a thing, has physical consequences. But how? Hey. Beginning in the 1980s, it was becoming clear to some scholars that dynamical systems, which is what this book is about, and evolutionary approaches to life and mind would fall short of this claim to universality. Uh, since I've skipped stuff, I'm not sure what the claim to universality refers to, but... Um, Because of their necessary grounding in what is physically here and now, they would not be able to escape this implicit dualism. Researchers who had been strongly influenced by systems thinking began to articulate this problem, and struggled with various attempts to augment systems thinking in ways that might, might be able to reintegrate the purposiveness of living processes and the experiential component of mental processes back into the theory. But the metaphysical problem of reintegrating purposeness, purposiveness and subjectivity into theories of physical processes led many thinkers to propose a kind of forced marriage of convenience between mental and physical modes of explanation. Although the problem is ancient and the weaknesses of contemporary methodologies have been acknowledged, there is no balanced resolution. For the most part, the mental half of any explanation is discounted as merely heuristic and likely illusory in the natural sciences. And even the most sophisticated efforts to integrate physical theories able to account for spontaneous order with theories of mental causality end up positing a sort of methodological dualism. Simply asserting this necessary unity that an observing subject must be a physical system with a self-referential character, avoids the implicit absurdity of denying absential phenomena, and yet it, it defines them out of existence. We seem to still be living in the shadow of Descartes. Mm -hmm. So as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about the author's bringing up the concept of virtual virtual objects, virtual systems uh, things that exist in what I interpret as the mimetic field or the mimetic plane, uh, especially when it comes to things like meaning So he seems to want to characterize them by their absence in the physical space in a way that I'm not as familiar with. I tend to think of these things as existing on like a different axis of 
existence, if that makes sense. But I am curious where it's going to go. Um, he's talking more about the number zero, which I've definitely seen used to refer to selfhood before, um, partly in regard to monadic ideas, partly because of the inability to perceive the thing that is uh, selfhood, which itself is, I think, related to the implicit contradiction of objecthood in general. I didn't used to, but I have developed anxiety about things like this. Like I'm afraid I'm going to read something that invalidates my own experience. Which doesn't really make sense. But I'm sensitive to it because, because of a form of dissociation that I experienced once. That was a rejection. But there's very little reason to think that such an experience is going to come from another human through a book. The way language works is uh, additive. I don't know if that's the term for it. I remember the first time I ever thought seriously about what it means to have a brain. Although, no doubt, repeated recall and embellishment overwrote the details many times, the images and their emotional impressions, emotional impressions still come freshly to mind. I was seven or eight years old, watching a cartoon illustrated science film about how bodies work. As I remember it now, the animated sequences provided a tour inside a person's body. Instead of the fearful, undulating swamp of tubes and pumps I'd been led to expect lay hidden there, the animation depicted a little man engaged in managing something halfway between a large machine and a small factory, busily shifting from task to task in his white coat. He monitored gauges, twiddled dials, and periodically erupted into panic when confronted with a surprising stimulus or a potential malfunction. Five devices that constituted the five, five senses produced signals that were routed to a single master control room in the head. In this room, the little man, who vaguely resembled Professor Einstein, sat at a control panel puzzling over his many instruments. I was recently reminded of this childhood experience by a similar, though tongue-in-cheek, film called Osmosis Jones, released in 2001 told the half-filmed, half-animated story of a man, a disease, and a comic series of events from both his perspective and that of dozens of little men and women running the factory of his body. Thankfully, the animation was better, and it was a comedy. There were plots within plots, literally, about the physiological equivalence of criminality, pandemonium, and, yes, plenty of goo. The familiarity of the animated minions of the body helped make thinking about body functions fun and as a way to reach kids whose fears of knots of messy spaghetti and slimy guts might otherwise get in the way of understanding body functions. 
a vision of little men and women struggling to manage the body politic is both comprehensible and unthreatening. I'm reminded of um, Inside Out, which I don't think existed when this was written. I wonder what he would say about that one, though. Of course, even young children can see through these playful analogies. I knew the animation that I saw at seven or eight was really only somebody's whimsical way of explaining something that might be a whole lot more complicated. Despite this awareness, the animation both intrigued and disturbed me. If there was a little man in my head surveying the important information of my body and making all its important decisions to mobilize this or that mechanism, then where was I? Was I him? If I wasn't, who was I? Why didn't it seem like I was a little man trapped in a large machine? The idea twisted my imagination in knots. There was something weird here that I, that I couldn't quite put my finger on, and then it struck me. Even as a kid, there would have to be a little man in his head, too. The little man inside the man, responsible for analyzing sensory inputs and deciding on appropriate responses, is a homunculus, literally a little man. In the sense that I will use the term here, it refers to a form of explanation that pretends to be offering a mechanistic account of some living or mental phenomenon, but instead only appeals to another cryptically equivalent process at some lower level. Oh, sounds familiar. Although such an account appears to have the familiar form of explanation, where a complicated mechanism at one level is analyzed into lower level component mechanisms and their interactions, in this case, these lower level components exhibit properties that are no simpler than those they are purported to explain. Such an explanation is no explanation at all. The, uh, the existence of the universe comes to mind. The animation I recalled seeing as a child was part of a television production called Gateways to the Mind. B.F. Skinner recounted the same fanciful exposition of sensation as the springboard for summarizing the contributions of behaviorism during the first 50 years of the field's existence. One of the principal motivations for behavioral psychology was the desire to avoid mental concepts in explaining why we act the way we do to invoke mental states like beliefs and desires to explain our actions, assigns the major parts of the explanation to unobservable and equally unanalyzed causes. At best, it merely postpones the analysis. At worst, it convinces us that no further analysis is required. Using the show's portrayal of the little man in the brain's control room to make this point, Skinner says, the behavior of the homunculus was, of course, not explained. An explanation would presumably require another film, and it, in turn, another. So I, I, I see something like belief as a, uh, a virtual object, um, something that is composed of mimetic pieces and exists on the mimetic plane, and it, it has behavior and attractions of its own. In the sciences, homunculus arguments are closely related to the concept of preformationism. One of the most widely recognized versions of a homuncular explanation is immortalized in a woodcut. It is a depiction of a minute, fetus-shaped seed crouched in the head of a sperm. Right there. 
In the early days of biology, it was thought that the sperm might already exhibit the form of a miniature human, and that maturation consisted of the growth of this form, much the way that a plant might grow from the tiny little shoots and leaves encased within a germinating seed. Of course, neither new plants nor new humans began as preformed bodies. Assuming that the human physique was preformed from the beginning provided a material alternative to the then dominant idea that some non material essence or spiritual agency was responsible for shaping the developing body from its formless beginnings. Rather than form being imposed on the material of the developing body by an ineffable source, the process could in this way be seen as entirely material, but only if the form was already present in some minimal way from the beginning. I mean, you could say that the programming of DNA is the form being present, but it's highly abstracted. middle one is the is a presence of what might be described as a plantum plant plantunculus in a bean seed <laughs> and then a fanciful depiction of a homunculus constituting the functions of a person's mind and body there's a tiny little person in there and there's oh and he's right here too he's got a little video camera Lots of little levers and machinery. In recent scientific literature, the concept of the homunculus has come to stand for something more subtle and related to the misuse of teleological assumptions that Skinner criticizes. This is the sense of the concept I focus on here. Homunculi are the unacknowledged gap fillers that stand behind, outside, or within processes that assume te teleological properties, such as those exhibited by life and mind, while pretending to be explanations of these properties. Treating aspects of brain function as if they are produced by little demonic helpers begs the main questions that need answering. Doing so cryptically, disguised as something else, actually impedes our efforts to understand these functions. Consider this analogy from Christoph Koch and Francis Crick for the neural basis of perceptual consciousness. A good way to begin to consider the overall behavior of the cerebral cortex is to imagine that the front of the brain is looking at the sensory systems, most of which are at the back of the brain. Does the front of the brain looking at the back of the brain improve significantly on the following on the following hey Does the front of the brain looking at the back of the brain improve significantly on the following statement? Written more than a century earlier by Samuel Butler in Erewhon. What is a man's eye but a machine for the little creature that sits is a man's eye but a machine for the little creature that sits behind in his brain to look through. These sorts of blatantly homuncular rhetorical framings are often followed by caveats, arguing that they are mere anthropomorphic heuristics, later to be replaced with actual mechanistic details. But even beginning this way opens the door for homuncular connotations to be attributed to whatever mechanism is offered. Are Koch and Crick arguing that the frontal cortex has its own form of internal visual perception to see what the visual system is merely registering? 
Of course that can't be what they mean, but even caricaturing the explanation in these terms may invite their readers to frame the question in terms of looking for an ultimate homunculus. The ancestors of today's scientific homunculi were gods, demigods, elves, fairies, demons, and gremlins that people held responsible for meaningful coincidences, human disasters, and unexpected deviations from the norm. Malevolent spirits, acts of sorcery, poltergeist, fates, and divine plans imbued natural events with both agency and meaningfulness. In past millennia and in technologically undeveloped societies, homunculus accounts were routinely invoked in cases where mechanical causes were obscure or where physical correlations appeared meaningfully linked. Although these agents from another world have no legitimate place in contemporary science, they remain alive and well, hiding at the frayed edges of our theories and popular culture, wearing various new guises. These modern theoretical gremlins often sit at their virtual control panels behind names for functions that carry out some teleologically glossed task, such as informing, signaling, adapting, recognizing, or regulating some biological or neurological process. And they lurk in the shadows of theoretical assumptions or unnoticed transitions, an explanation where mechanistic descriptions get augmented by referring to functions and ends. Okay, so so far I like this chapter. This is this is nice. This is good. Let's uh, skip clumsily ahead. Let's see what's what's ahead. Information. The current era is often described as the information age, but although we use the concept of information almost daily without confusion, and we build machinery and networks to exchange, analyze, and store it, I believe that we still don't really know what it is. In our everyday lives, information is a necessity and a commodity. It has become ubiquitous largely because of the invention, perfection, and widespread use of computers and related devices that record, analyze, replicate, transmit, and correlate data entered by humans or collected by sensor mechanisms. The stored information is used to produce correspondences, invoices, sounds, images, and even precise patterns of robotic behavior on factory floors. We routinely measure the exact information capacity of data storage devices made of silicon, magnetic disks, or laser-sensitive plastics. Mm -hmm. Despite this seeming mastery, it is my contention that we currently are working with a set of assumptions about information that are only sufficient to handle the tracking of its most minimal physical and logical attributes, but are insufficient to understand either its defining representational character or its functional value. These are serious shortcomings that impede progress in many endeavors, from automated translation to the design of intelligent internet search engines. Again, I feel like this comes back to the nomadic ecosystem. <clears throat> I've got to make sure to read this book without priming myself too heavily towards a specific model if I want to the book on its own terms. It's hard to ignore that, though. In many ways, we are in a position analogous to the early 19th century physicists in the heyday of the Industrial Age, with its explosive development of self-powered machines for transportation, industry, timekeeping, etc whose understanding of energy was still laboring under the inadequate and ultimately fallacious conception of ethereal substances, such as caloric, that were presumably transferred from place to place to animate machines and organisms. Even though energy was a defining concept of the early 19th century, the development of a relational rather than a substantive concept of energy took many decades of scientific inquiry to clarify. 
The contemporary notion of information is likewise colloquially conceived of in substance-like terms. As, for example, when we describe the purchase and storage of information, or talk about it being lost or wasted in some process. Uh, this I want to... I would want to read this chapter in, like, side by side with the other James Glick book, uh, The Information, just to put the two in parallel and see where they resonate with each other and where they don't. I don't think I have a copy of that book. Perhaps I will make a trip to the library. Once I get there, who knows how long it's going to take to get there. Uh, two types of entropy. There's a thermodynamic entropy and then informational entropy. And I, I do remember um, Claude Shannon's entropy from the book, The Information. Which is about the, the amount of information that can be present in, a, in any given like piece of media, essentially. It's like the bits of information that can be extracted. Uh, so I'm curious what this will say about that. Do you ever worry that turning off your computer or erasing its memory or just replacing its operating system could be an immoral act? Every damn time. Many serious scientists and philosophers believe that brains are just sophisticated organic computers. So maybe this should be a worry to them. Of course, maybe turning off the machine is more analogous to sleep or temporary anesthesia because no data need be lost or analytic processes permanently disrupted by such a temporary shutdown. But erasing data or corrupting software to the point that it is unusable does seem to have more potent moral implications. If you do sometimes contemplate the moral implications of these activities, it is most likely because you recognize that doing so could affect someone else who might have produced or used the data or software. The morality has to do with the losses that these potential users might suffer, and this would be of little concern were all potential users to suddenly disappear. Aside from the issue of potential harm to users, the nagging question is whether there is someone home, so to speak, when a computation is being performed, something intrinsically subjective about the processing of data through the CPU of the mechanism. Only if the computer or computational process can have what amounts to experiences and thus possesses sentience, is there any intrinsic moral issue to be considered. So the terms sentience and consciousness are sometimes conflated, sometimes they're defined one way, perhaps another way. It seems like this artist is describing sentience as the ability to have experiences. So for the presence of qualia or subjective subject subjectivity subjective experience so if that's the case i'm curious what his definition of consciousness is let's see <clears throat> the emergent higher order form of sentience that is found in animals with brains is a form of sentience built upon sentience uh, it seems like maybe that's not going to be a straightforward answer. Maybe specifically because the definition of sentience maybe is going to be made more complicated. Okay, well. There's obviously a lot here, 
and it's not going to be fair to the book to try to extract it piecemeal. So I'll just have to start here at the beginning and go from there. So thank you for joining me in meandering through these two books and discussing some of the topics. Let me know if you have any comments or questions or anything to say about the authors or the books. Otherwise, Have a good night, or morning, or afternoon, and I'll talk to you later.